Hello? Hey, it's Brett. Hey, it's Tiffany. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Tiffany? I'm good. I'm just getting our agenda and notes page set up. So I live in Arkansas, and every Wednesday at noon, we have a tornado siren. Just oh, wow. As a, as a, so it's happening. And so I'm watching my dog because he likes to howl and talk to it. So me if you hear yeah i don't even hear it that's uh good yeah it was really weird um when we there he goes you hear him? <laughs> that's great it was really weird when we first moved out here it took a couple of weeks to get used to i moved from california and in california we would do like earthquake drills and stuff in class where we got under the desk but they never had an actual siren. And so getting used to the siren was a trip. I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah, that's a lot. Hey, Mike. Hello, how's it going? I'm getting the um, agenda notes page set up here. All right. Get so a better light here. Hi, Mike. Hey, Brett, how's it going? Good, man, how are you? Great, thank you. Trying to get my light figured out here. Nothing's working. There we go. Mike, you're uh, Cincinnati, right? Okay, cool. Yes, I am. We uh, just had uh, Indie Coalition come visit Mortar there. Uh, oh, awesome. Last week? Cool. Yeah, last week. Yeah, they're good guys for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it sounds like they're expanding too. They're starting to talk about um, other cities that they're they're going to take on, kind of in a paced, uh, in a paced way. But awesome. um, yeah, it's good to hear. That's great. What are you up to? Uh, work wise. <laughs> In general, work-wise. Oh uh, yeah. Well, we just uh, we had a nice trip to New York. Uh, brought the eight and 11 year old up there for um, wow. to see the city and do the Christmas spectacular and everything. So that awesome. was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. Brett, it's, where do you live right now? I'm in Wake Forest, North Carolina, which is just outside of Raleigh. North Car is it snowy there? Mm -mm. No, no, we, uh, we did have a little bit of a cold snap come in last night, but I mean, that's still puts it in like the mid forties for a high. So does North Carolina have the weather where it's like 40s in the morning, but then maybe 60s in the evening and 20s at night, just all over the place? No, it's pretty consistent. It's still pretty Eastern seaboard. Um, we just get it better than the Northeast does in terms of temps and um, we get a ton of sunshine, which is what I love. Um, That's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we, it's a beautiful day here today. Perfect blue sky. Um, I spent five years going to school in Arizona and that was it. Like I just, I grew up in Buffalo and I was, I said, there's no way I can do this ever again. <laughs> you know, once you get a taste of it, it's, it's hard to go back. Glued to the pavement in Arizona, I bet. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Hey, Andy. Hey everyone. How's it going team? Now you hey, got, Andy. No, right? You guys are pretty cold up there in Kansas. I'll talk about it. <laughs> Sore subject. One of my colleagues just went to Hawaii. I was like, really? <laughs> it's, it is what it is. It's, uh, um, it's, it's slowing down for the, the Christmas holiday or the whole holiday season. And I like it when it snows, when it's Christmas, but when I'm trying to get to work when it snows, you're like, what the heck? Mike, how was France, Paris? Uh, I ended up Paris? not going. Ended up not going. Sadly, no. Yes, ah. we've had uh, we've had some family family things going on, so uh, locking it down a little bit. All right. Well, that's good. That's that's the right thing to do. But Paris. Yeah, that's is right. Good. You got it. Yep. <laughs> Paris will still be there, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, we'll see how all the Congress thing finishes up today, but it might be the end of Western democracy as we know it, so we'll see. Yeah. We'll all have to move to Paris. <laughs> Can't come soon well, on, that happy, on that happy note, this is Pete Critico's checking in. Hey, Pete. 
Yeah. Hi, Peter. Peter, I just met with the folks from um, the Coleman Foundation. Anybody know the Coleman Foundation? No, I don't. They know you, so that was interesting. They they they, they mentioned they have they the gentleman mentioned. <laughs> well, read your words. The, they they saw my picture in the post office or what? But maybe maybe the Coleman Foundation is um they're out of Chicago somewhere, but they're um, historically actually had vested a lot in entrepreneurship, but historically entrepreneurial education. And my understanding from the gentleman there was that the Coleman Foundation used to be in a little bit of competition with the Coffin Foundation around funding entrepreneurship education. But what he said, I thought you all might find interesting, which I think is true, is he so, said. So who did you talk to at Coleman? Uh, I may know the Mark is his name. Well, give it a, give it a, again. Clark, uh, I will tell you in a second. You know when you have those phone calls and you're like, I don't remember the guy's last name? That's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll look it up. Hold on. It's somewhere on this computer. I think. Let's see. So somebody mentioned Paris. I was supposed to be there too. Oh, goodness. Oh, gosh. Oh, for two. Uh, but not only that, it was Paris and London. Oh. And that blew, that trip blew up and I'm trying to figure out how to recover the $2,700 we invested in it. Uh, oof. Well, so it was a combination of this, well, it was a combination of strikes and then Icelandic Air, which is a long story how I got on that. Um, wouldn't do a change so that we could just divert directly to London for anything less than six hundred dollars change fee. Oh. Six hundred dollars. Yeah, that's and crazy. No additional service, nothing. You know, it's just and so when we added it up plus the additional costs of being in London because we were staying with friends in Paris, um, they added days um, to what we already had booked. It, it was got to the point where we just said, you know, we'll eat, we'll, we'd rather eat it than try to spend another sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars to try to fix a trip. So, so no credits? They didn't give you any credits for what you had already purchased? No, nothing, nothing. Hmm. So I had travel insurance uh, through. American Express. Uh -huh. uh, note to everybody on the call: Do not. Um, the American Express travel insurance is not very robust, hmm. um, <laughs> and so they weren't covering the strikes in Paris because we were relying on train service and stuff like that, and all of that was just up in the air, uh -huh. and um, so we couldn't couldn't risk it. You know about you know, what, was the train going to run from Paris to London uh, when we had the tickets. And then the, um, um, but there was a there, there's a provision in the insurance that provide that uh, allows for cancellation due to um, active terrorism. And unfortunately, the the stabbing there was a stabbing that occurred in London on November 29th. Fortunately, it was called an act of terrorism by the Queen and the police chief and others, uh, all the newspapers. So we're, we're, we we're filing on that basis as well as the strikes. Did I get you out of the insurance? The insurance people are like celebrated the act of terrorism because it got them out of that. Interesting. Right. <laughs> well, but I mean, if it's, I mean, if it's, if the official word is that it, yeah, if, totally. if people sense. describe it as terrorism, I mean, that, that came from the government, you know, from the head of state. Um, I'm picturing you, I'm picturing and, you in court calling the queen. My yeah. next witness is the queen. Yeah, you know, but um, I'm just betting that they don't understand that the queen is head of state, but that's, that's another issue. Well, good, good luck. Good luck. I hope you get your dough yeah. back, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I will say I, one, one time and then um, we can, we can uh, move to our next topic. But one, one time I watched a guy at an airport get in a fight with, a, with like a Delta counter guy around what constitutes an act of God because he had the policies out and the guy said, well, it's it, whatever was an act of God. And the guy literally got in like a fight. And I was like, are we being literal or philosophical here? Because technically, depending on who you are, I think everything's an act of God. And so in that case, <coughs> I'm not getting credit. Is that what you're saying? But they literally got into this yelling match over what an act of God is. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, it was entertaining because I wasn't in it. 
But if I was in it, I'm sure I would have been rolling my eyes and throwing the pit too. Yeah, there's there's pretty good case law on what an after bet is. I mean, that's that's pretty well established. But um, but it is <laughs> it isn't that we're all here on the planet, but you know, for the grace of God. So anyway, the one the one thing I want to finish my little story from earlier because you you all might find it interesting, but. Um, the Coleman Foundation has spent the last 20 years investing mostly in, I think, the Chicagoland region around entrepreneurship mm -hmm. education, and a lot of spent a lot of money at colleges and universities um, and funded a lot of things there. And they have basically declared victory after 20 years that the entrepreneurship mm -hmm. education in Chicago is um, doesn't need funding anymore because there's so much of it, and so they're shifting their attention to ecosystem building on a neighborhood level. Um, because a lot of their grantees um, are in neighborhoods that don't have access to that education or don't feel like they have access to the education. And so he was calling me to talk about ecosystems and to talk about what the role of a funder is in, in fostering ecosystems. So I thought that was an interesting, I mean, Coffin Foundation um, sort of did a similar thing. I, victory might not be the word he used, but we sort of declared success on 30 years of funding entrepreneurial research. And then when we started doing that work 30 years ago, there was no such thing and people said it couldn't be researched. Um, and obviously there are lots of people researching it now. And so we've shifted obviously our attention to, to not obviously, but we uh, sort of shifted our attention to yeah. more about uh, curating the best research and helping apply it to practice. And so it was interesting to hear that from another foundation. Yeah, I, I know the name. I just haven't really focused on it before. And um, you know, they've been sort of, they're, they're, they're sort of in the woodwork. Plus, you know, if they've been funding entrepreneurship research, um, they wouldn't necessarily fall into sort of the workforce world. Yeah, totally. um, or even, frankly, even the economic development world. I mean, it's, it depends it's, yeah. depends on how they niche themselves. But um, it's intriguing. Hmm. Check them out. Cool. Hi, Katie. Hey there. Sorry I'm a few minutes late. Couldn't find a parking space. Oh, all good. Hi, Katie. It's good to hear you. Hi. Andy. Um, are you, if you're on the phone, maybe we'll, since you probably can't see, or maybe you're not on the phone. You? I, uh, I have video on and I have the uh, have uh, computer audio on, so I don't know why my video isn't showing up. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just on the phone. Sorry about that, folks. Well, Katie, we were just really talking about another foundation, the Coleman Foundation, who has heard of Peter. They're a big fan, and they're also changing their focus on entrepreneur funding to ecosystem building funding. And so that was just an interesting experience um, that Andy had had. Have you had any recent interesting experiences in your world regarding anything that you're working on? Um. I like to think every day is like an interesting experience. Um, I guess the biggest thing for me is um, the Launch Wake County program that I've been working on that we have community-based uh, entrepreneurship programs in seven towns in Wake County. Um, we just graduated our 305th person. And because of, because of the, the uh, traction we've gotten, and this is a surreal blessing, was going to hire two people to help me kind of run this program which I've been doing it with a half of a person and sometimes I could buy 25% more of her I felt like a human trafficker but <laughs> um but that's been pretty interesting you guys know that NACI is moving their headquarters to our to to uh, Wake Tech and to the campus that I'm on yeah, in Cary North Carolina I'm gonna bring that up that's a big coup and congratulations um, Wake Tech continues to make itself very visibly nationally for, not just for that a number of people tell me there's great all the stuff y'all are doing there but the fact that macy is <laughs> to put the house there is is a huge uh, feather in the cap for all the work we're on entrepreneurship yeah we're really tickled um and you know we, we feel very privileged is everyone on the call familiar with nacy it might help if not for katie just mm -hmm. to give, give us the we got some notes okay it's a Give us a couple sentences on what NACI is. Okay, so NACI stands for, because what is anything without a good acronym? Um, mm -hmm. NACI is the National Association for Community College Entrepreneurship. 
and um, they're a member, they're, they're a membership nonprofit. They have about 350 community colleges across the country as members and they help promote entrepreneurship training and skills within the community college environment, both internally with students and externally with the community. And just recently they initiated a, um, an HBCU focus based on some money they got from Verizon. Because as it turns out, the HBCUs and the community colleges um, both serve the non-traditional student um, our students tend to be older, have fewer resources at, at the community college and also at the HBCUs now. A lot of them are older, fewer resources, and some of them with a lot of baggage, you know, like criminal records and things like that. Um, so we have that common thing, so it makes sense to work together. So um, we're tickled, we've been a member for a while, we're tickled that they chosen to move their headquarters here. I would just add uh, a couple of things. Uh, NACI has been a national resource provider with the ship Summit, and Rebecca Corbin, who runs that, is a, just a dynamic leader. And uh, mm -hmm. they um, have, I, 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 I would just tell you a story. I, I got invited to their, their summit three years ago, right after I started at Kaufman. And I'll tell you, I, I'll be honest, I, I walked in a little skeptical because I thought, well, you know, community college, folks like they get entrepreneurship education but, but do they get anything else and then i was just blown away at how many folks in NACI were talking ecosystems and thinking as ecosystem builders and they have all these presidents the the whole organization is actually run by a board of presidents of like i don't know 15 or 20 of the community colleges and then to hear all the president talking about the role of a community college is to build the ecosystem uh and so that was just flooring and exciting and then they actually, uh, NAC under Rebecca's leadership, published a book uh, last year that's really around, it's, this is not the title, but it's really around community colleges ecosystem leadership leader. And it's penned by about 15 different folks um, you know, across the country. And so if you have a community college in your community that, or, or run into them, the communities you're working in, that really want to understand their role as an ecosystem builder, uh, the book is an excellent excellent tool uh, written by people who run community colleges. Uh, and it's just, it's a really, really impressive uh, group. And maybe, um, you know, if Brett, your the audience of Forward Cities is really folks working in sort of the community building world, trying to build ecosystems. NACI is the same folks, but typically who wear a community college, college hat. And, uh, it's a really, really cool group. And the fact they're at Wake Tech, I think, speaks to how well Wake Tech and the whole community there is doing around um, entrepreneurship, ecosystems, and leadership as well. Thank what, you. What was that book called, Andy? That's a great question. Let's um, <laughs> check. I can't remember the name of it either, and I've had it. Well, I wrote the, I wrote the introduction. That's not yes. what it was, just the introduction, so you'd think I would remember the name. That's right, two demerits. Two demerits. <laughs> hey, Katie, you know, uh, it's called Community Colleges as Incubators of Innovation. Yeah. And, uh, and it came out just here. I'll, actually, I'll just post it up here uh, in the... Um, and uh, in the in the chat, and no, Tiffany, I'll even do you one up. I'll put it in the. They're working on a second book, from what I understand. I don't know what, what? the focus is on that. Hmm. Um, Katie, I, I know we briefly met last time. I'm up in Wake Forest, so I'd love to find ways to bleed some of our work into what. Um, Oh my goodness, What's Brad. Going on with launch? I know we got Launch Wake Forest here, and um, so we need to grab some lunch. We do, because we need to grow that program in Wake Forest. They're so different, you know, every town personality is different, and I, I can't impose. There, there are certain things I can't impose. I'll just choke the life out of it. Uh huh. So every team gets their own spin on it, and, and my Launch Wake Forest guy is, he's just so, he's very smart, very competent, and my team there is very skinny. If anybody gets hit by a bus, it's the whole program's gonna die. <laughs> so I'd love to meet with you. Um, I have I'm actually have a meeting in Wake Forest tomorrow. I'm meeting with the town manager to oh, see cool. if I can get more town support for launch Wake Forest. And I also met with um, today a uh, one of the co-working companies. They're about to take over Bob Johnson's space. They're on the corner. Yeah, yeah. Probably it's, uh... I forget what it's called. I have a friend that goes there. It was Hatch. 
called yeah. Hatch. Okay. And so they're about to embark on about a year long renovation and it's going to be managed by somebody else. Oh, okay. So there will be a real co-working space in Wake Forest eventually. That's great. Yeah. yeah let's, so yeah. Let's connect offline. Yeah. I can't meet with you tomorrow because I'm going to be running like crazy, but maybe after the holidays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make, I'll, re make I'll reach out separately. It. Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's great. Well, congratulations, Katie, on your new staff and your expansion. That's huge. That's good. Thank you. How about you, Mike? I'm sorry that you are not in Paris, but yay for being with us right now. What's new with you? Thanks. Um, well, <laughs> I'll be honest. We, we've had a family medical issue, and I'll maybe go into it more off the call, but the last uh, two weeks were we're sort of dealing with family health things. And so uh, I wish I had much better news uh, other than that, but it's really where my head has been the last two, three weeks. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's always interesting, um, you know, sharing with family members and uh, kind of seeing how the community uh, and your family steps up as you're figuring things out so anyway i'm being super cryptic but yeah my my wife uh my wife has a, a health issue we're working on so um anyway that's that's where my energy and time has been for the last few weeks that's why i didn't go to paris in fact um and so uh yeah it's just always good to see how immediately people step up and uh you know are offering to to help with things and and be there for you so we we have a really good outlook on things i think it's it's hopefully all going to be all right but it's going to be uh you know a tough few months and a tough year in front of us so we're we're hopeful um so anyway that's you know very openly that's where my energy and time have been uh for a bit now um, and rightfully so that's right you got it and i'll, I'll say i'll say that uh it, it does get <laughs> it gets tough because some of the stuff that i'm scheduled to go work on in january in particular uh, is, you know, some global commons, uh, you know, first prototyping of, uh, you know, set of targets for the planetary system. And so we're trying to piece together a team to see kind of who can, who can go do some of that work. Is there, is there any part of it that I might still, uh, you know, go for a couple days, but I was supposed to take two weeks in January, which is definitely not happening. So, uh, yeah, so it's just it rapidly makes you reprioritize and uh kind of see what's important and you know take every minute uh differently mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, I'll, I'll, on a very different note um ecosystem building wise i'll just say that i uh I've talked with several people who are interested in this concept and i posted this article on the slack channel um, interested in how we can learn from bio and this is something peter had had mentioned uh you know how do we learn from uh, biological systems and what happens in nature and how do we maybe model our work and, the, and our language even after that. Uh, I'll just say also the value web, the, the work in Paris was the value of trying to figure itself out a little bit and figure out what our model is. And the thing that I think we're coming to is really around how we can be a community, uh, how we can start to share and generate, um, you know, new new seeds, how we can put things out there in the world that can grow from that. Um, and so the, the role that I keep thinking about ecosystem building, the, the way we've used that language before, uh, is more toward what are the natural systems and natural processes that are in place that we can support and what is support for natural things. And this resonates with uh, the environment work we're doing too. But what are the natural things in place that we can support? Um, rather than thinking of what do we uh, what do we construct or build and I know that it can seem like a subtle difference but it does make me wonder you know we talk about uh, for the sustainability work what's the work that nature's already doing what can trees do better than any new technological invention um, and so anyway it makes me wonder for, for the ecosystem work what does support of natural systems look like uh, and what are the implications for our network and the jobs that we're all trying to work on. That was a lot. It would have happened. 
Can you ever? I think you have a lot of background noise. If yeah. uh, maybe you can. It, it. it might be me too, because I'm had some people walking by talking. Well, Mike, that is really interesting, um, and that's really a good segue to sort of the general topic of what we're hoping to at least address today. You know, it's December 18th. Everyone's sort of half in the bag for the holidays. And we had put in the agenda um, that we would start to identify our goals or at least our hopes for 2020. And so having that, that lean towards viewing ecosystem, and it sounds like we're even maybe moving away from that word, we're building in regards to the natural system, but ecosystem, I, I don't even know what word to use right there, but you know, how, how does that relate to goal three in, in a shared vision? Um, you know, oh, hey, Eric. <laughs> so, you know, the people, all of you guys who really are vested in, in creating a shared vision and lexicon for this field, you know, do you have particular hopes for 2020 or do you, what are your thoughts as it pertains to leaning more towards a natural systems approach or what are ideas on, on all of that? Well, I know that um, the first time I went to the E-SHIP Summit, um, and so I've only been in job, this job at Wake Tech for, for five years, and my program is only three years old. So I went year last year to the E-SHIP Summit and didn't go, get to go this year. But one of the things that bothered me was that um, in Wake County, where we have 12 municipalities, um, there were no Wake County mayors at the mayor's event. And so one of the things I want to do in 2020 is get some of my mayors over there so they can be fed the Kool-Aid. Um, I, I, I like Mike's perspective. There are so many, we have of um, an ecosystem that we just have not recognized and named. And so perhaps if we focus on identifying the existing elements and then try to connect them, you put the connective tissue in there instead of trying to build something. Maybe that's, maybe that's what it is. You figure out where, where, your, where your assets are, where the elements of an ecosystem exist, and make sure that you get those connected. And then, then you can see where there's an obvious hole or void. Yeah, that that's so well said. I, I just feel like, um, you know, there's there's this this concept of building that needs to happen, and obviously you're going to build pieces of an ecosystem um, as we go. But there's so much to Katie's point that already exists and just isn't connected. Um, and and I'm really shifting my view of how to do this work based on you know really really trying to. Um, stress existing assets in our cities and how how are they just not reaching some of the um, target populations and, and neighborhoods that um, don't fully take part in in an entrepreneurial ecosystem um, in each city. So thinking of goal for connected networks, how do you see the work in goal? My I'm sorry. Anyway, it was, it's the uh, first meeting of our partners on achieving the promise of work. And, and uh, thanks to Mike's great help, uh, we're, have, we have a terrific facilitator, um, uh, Scott Holzman, that's going to be uh, helping us with this. But one of the ideas that we're going to be uh, introducing um, is part of our initiative is to have conversations at the, in communities about what's happening in, ter in terms of how work is being restructured and the dynamics that are occurring within the community, but also what are the strengths that exist and how do we build, how do communities build from their, from their strengths, from, from the talent towards some, some new future. And part of that's going to be entrepreneurship. Some of it's going to be some other activities as well. But we've been searching around for a protocol to try to figure out how do we even have a conversation because for for my group or for any group to be kind of swooping into a community and saying 
here we're here to help and you know we're going to fix things for you it's just not going to work um it's 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 insulting to the community it's insulting to the it it, it demeans in fact the, the the very qualities that we're trying to help support um and uh, i found this protocol that or guidelines they call them um, that this group out of france has used and and their target is um um uh, working with and um, building from the knowledge of communities who are in extreme poverty. And um, it's an extraordinarily empathetic um, protocol. It's one that um, treats, treats everybody with, with respect, but, and it also, um, <clears throat> it, 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 it engages the community to talk about and to, 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 to recognize that, that the real um, answers to a lot of what they're seeking to do begins with what they already have in terms of their knowledge and skills and culture and so forth. Uh, I'm happy to share with the group. I don't, I can't do it now because like I said, I'm on the phone, but um, we're, we're, we're proposing that we modify this to um, deal with multiple stakeholders uh, while preserving the agency of those who often are not, um, aren't able to, to, to uh, are denied the opportunity to speak for themselves. Um, so it's, uh, so it's going to be a work in progress for us, but um, it sort of builds, frankly, Mike, on the idea again of what, what do you start with and, and who's in it and what's the, what are the values that are already are in place and, and let's, and let's uh, celebrate that and, and sort out how this moves forward in a more collective fashion uh, in terms of ecosystem uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem um, approaches as well so like i said i'm happy to share with the group i i just can't physically do it right now but um i'm happy to also report how <laughs> how it goes over tomorrow uh and see what we get with it but um um you know who knows we might be re going back to the you know, starting point again on this, but I kind of doubt it. Mm. Hope it goes great. Yeah. I have a question, yeah. guys. Uh, and so sometimes we say ecosystem building, and sometimes we say entrepreneurial ecosystem builder. And you know, in my Poe Barefoot Country Girl's brain, I get confused. Um, when I look around the, the triangle area, it seems like we've got multiple ecosystems. Like there is there is an art, there is an artistic ecosystem and there's um, an entertainment ecosystem and there's a sports ecosystem and then there's an education ecosystem and I'm looking specifically at an entrepreneurial ecosystem and because that makes it simpler for me to think about it because I don't have to think about all that other stuff. So, so when I think, when I say ecosystem builder, I'm, I'm talking specifically about entre entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, as opposed to any of that other stuff, even though those other things may be layered, you know, like, like layers of a cake, you know, those other ecosystems are layered and maybe there's movement up and down between the layers. But um, I've had to simplify it and say I'm talking specifically about entrepreneurial ecosystem, otherwise it, I, it gets too complicated for me to put my brain around. How do you guys think about it? I'll just say that to be honest, resonates. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, actually, I'm kind of the opposite. Um, because um, it, the, within the art, you know, you mentioned art, art, you know, art, artistic ecosystem. And with, within those, within that system is, um, I can point to um, just many examples of how entrepreneurship emerges out of the artistic entrepreneurs emerge out of the art, artistic ecosystem and you know the, the challenge is always putting boundaries and then mm -hmm. we're you know, in, in trying to figure out where some boundary exists and where something is inside and outside and the, the, and so I I tend to try to my own approach is to is to sort of minimize the number of boundaries and appreciate that they're um, they're, they're that the sort of there isn't a standard operating definition of what an entrepreneur is and where that person comes from. 
Um, but that's just me. I, and that may not be very helpful to you. It, 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 um, I, I could see it work the other way for other, in, in other ways where you do establish boundaries, but as, as sort of an operating principle for, for the way I approach things, I, I tend to try to eliminate them. I was just going to say what, what resonates uh, with me is that we've, we've talked before about, um, you know, when we come back to a vision or mission or values, when we say, well, who, who, for whom, or for what, mm -hmm. uh, is this for entrepreneurial ecosystems? Is it for ecosystem builders? Um, is it for, on some level, entrepreneurs? Um, is it for the field? Uh, you know, I think these things are all obviously connected and uh, not distinct, but at the same time, you can imagine very different slices that express very differently based on who it's for and which piece of that whole puzzle we're talking about. Uh, if we somehow would articulate um, a vision for ecosystem builders in terms of entrepreneurs, I mean, that's something you can imagine. You can imagine saying our vision for ecosystem builders is entrepreneurs who have uh, no barriers, who have equal access or something like that. And so I think these pieces all live at different layers, but they're all deeply connected. Um, I think what I'd love to go back to, what would we like to see in the next year? I'd love to see uh, some tries at some things and to say, well, if we're talking about, um, you know, a vision for the field that gets spoken in terms of what happens and what the effect is for entrepreneurs. Here's a version of that vision that maybe is helpful. If we're talking about uh, the role that the people that we're interested in supporting, uh, if we want to name that in terms of supporting natural systems, here's a version of that. I think trying some things out and seeing how they play together, uh, iterating them, to me, that's what I'd love to see uh, 2020 kind of experiment with. I'll build on something, this is Andy, I'll build on what Mike said uh, and go back to Katie's question then I can actually maybe bring it back to what Mike finished with. So the way, you know, one of the, there's a line in the Kaufman ecosystem playbook drafty thing, real drafty thing, um, that actually we stole from a biology book and the line, the original line from the biology book was something to the effect of the primary function of an ecosystem and it was talking about like a natural ecosystem like a rainforest was to move is to move nutrients from the place that has it to the thing that needs it, and that is sometimes collaborative and sweet, and sometimes it looks like a, a you know lion eating a gazelle. And so what we realized that there was an analogy there that works really well for entrepreneurs, and that the primary function of an entrepreneurial ecosystem is to move knowledge and resources from the people who have it to the entrepreneurs who need it. And so it's, it's easier to think kind of what Mike was saying, like instead of thinking what is an ecosystem, what is, what is not, what is in, what is out, that's really difficult to do because all these systems are connected and nested and on top of each other. And you don't even know where the edge is anyway. Like I can't even tell if I'm in Kansas City's ecosystem or not. You know, I live in Kansas City, am I in it or not in it? I don't know. Um, but that because there aren't clear edges, you kind of get lost in a spiral of confusing thoughts when you try to figure out where the edge is. Um, so to rather think about who is it for and for whom is it, which is what Mike said, and what is the benefit or the thing they're getting. And so an entrepreneurial ecosystem is really about moving the knowledge and resources from wherever it is in the community to the entrepreneur exactly when they need it, exactly the thing they need, exactly when they need it. In a perfect system, which doesn't really exist, but in a vacuum, in a perfect system, it would happen just instantly through the coordination of all these things. Um, and it's not central coordination, it's like self-organization. Um, but those other ecosystems that you talk about, I think, Katie, are really important, like the arts ecosystem or the education ecosystem. Um, those all interact with that function of helping entrepreneurs get the knowledge and they need. And I think we get a little lost when we try to m truly map it and spell out the system. And so what has helped me a lot is to stop thinking about defining the system and more just think about what is the role of the leader in that system. And so I know on this call, Mike has given two awesome presentations on some thinkings on systems leadership and how that can sort of move systems forward. And that's really what ecosystem building is like, what is the role of the ecosystem building and what are the skills to, to make that system work better towards its mission of moving knowledge and resources from people who have it to the entrepreneurs. 
um, but we know they're they're interrelated. The other piece I would just add really quickly, just from my own learnings, is that I think that ecosystem building is actually another way to say systems leadership. And this style of systems leadership, as as Mike has sort of presented in previous calls in his, or the last call, that like this is the 21st century way to lead, and it's very different from top down sort of style, you know, like hierarchical leadership. And this style of leadership is beginning to pop up as entrepreneurial ecosystem building, but that same style of leadership is beginning to pop up in all systems. So the fact, Katie, you can even see that there are different systems is actually you're ahead of the game. Most people aren't even looking at the systems level. They're just either trying to solve their thing in the corner or looking at the problems that these systems are manifesting. And so one just final story to tell is, is how I think that ecosystem building without the word entrepreneur in front of it actually applies to all sorts of systems. So there's educational ecosystem building, there's arts ecosystem building. And I think that 80% of the work of an ecosystem leader or ecosystem builder, whether it's arts ecosystems, creative ecosystems, entrepreneurial ecosystems, it's actually the same stuff. It's how do you lead a system? The 20% that's different is really different. So it might be different if you're if you're optimizing for entrepreneurs in an entrepreneurial ecosystem versus if you're optimizing for student outcomes in an education ecosystem but that ecosystem building without the word entrepreneur in front of it is happening in all sorts of systems and if you just if you just if you, you start to notice it popping up ever it's because the traditional way of leading top-down hierarchical and command and control where someone is in charge isn't working in this world and so we're all emerging a new thing. And everyone on this call has emerged their own understanding of it because it was like, well, the other thing wasn't working and you all were smart enough to say, well, we got to try something different. Any, how does that strike you, Katie? Is just all those thoughts kind of piled on each other. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So, so Andy, let me ask you a question. Is this, is it different from community organizing? Ecosystem building? Yeah, I think it, I think ecosystem building is a component, or sorry, community community organizing is a component yeah. of ecosystem building. The way okay. I the, the frame the frame I use in my head is that e and this is there's a line in the playbook that also captures this, but it's essentially that ecosystem building is emerging at the intersection of economic development, which is traditionally top down planning, community development, which is more that bottom up community organizing thing. Uh, workforce development, which is really around talent and developing talent, and uh, venture development, which is really around businesses. So I say that succinctly, community development, economic development, workforce development, and venture development. At that intersection of all those things is where this practice of ecosystem building is emerging. And the reason I have come to that conclusion, the simple reason I have come to the conclusion, there's a more complex, complicated one we can get into later, but is that if you look, if you simply look at who is showing up at the eShip Summit when a call is put out for people who want to build ecosystems, you get folks from all four of those vent, those places showing up saying, I do ecosystem building. And what, what also strikes me about all that, and anyone who works in communities knows this, is in most communities, those four offices are in different buildings. Those people don't really talk to each other. And in many cases, at least in my experience in Iowa, those people really don't like each other. And so, so the ecosystem builder's job is to really figure out how to get those four different approaches to leadership and sort of systems, uh, types of systems in a community to work in synchronicity to try to help entrepreneurs succeed. That's my take on it. I, I, I don't have a huge background in two of those areas. So I, I don't want to say that is the definitive answer, but I'd say that's where I've come to in the, in the journey of the last couple of years and trying to be able to explain it. Which also goes back to language and identity whether those people identify as, you know, fundamentally opposed or fundamentally on the same team. Yeah. It's also why it's really difficult to get to a shared vision because if you took each of those four groups and said, what are you, what is, what does success look like to you? They would say four different things. All of them are important to a thriving, vibrant community, but like their job is like workforce development, talented workforces that can fill jobs and they're going to count those jobs and those placements because your economic developer is going to, is going to count tax base and everything and community development is going to be you know lots of lots of different indicators the community development obviously venture development is going to measure things like companies invested in and companies started and so everyone's incentivized to be different which is why it's so hard to come up with a common vision i think in communities that get all those people fired up 
So to answer Tiffany's question, I would say one of my visions, one of my hopes for 2020 is that we can use all another, the gathering of the folks at the next eShip Summit in June to try to actually, and I really would challenge this group to help, help us figure it out, but like what's a process we can use to bring those four, those four different types of folks and any other shades of folks <laughs> related to those things to really try to, what's a process to get to a point where we can have a vision for the field that really makes all those groups say, I want to be on that train. Yeah, and I, I'd be interested to hear Eric's thoughts on it, but I, I feel like Ford Cities is running into this over and over again, um, trying to bring disparate and um, highly disagreeable um, segments of the same community together for some of this common um, collective organizational work. Um, it, we just had a, a conversation about it this morning with what we're doing in New Kensington, Pennsylvania around um, what a year it's been to try to get some of these people to even be in the same room together without, you know, um, leading with their primary selfish interests um, and surrendering those for uh, a process which, you know, might not in the end actually benefit them directly, but would um, strengthen the environment for other organizations and individuals um, in that space to be successful. So um, it, it, it just, it feels like the battleground uh, for our work in a lot of and ways. The thing I would remind, I always try to remind myself, you know, on this work is that thing you just described, that's actually ecosystem building. Like, mm -hmm. yes, ecosystem building involves creating accelerators, incubators, venture capital funds, bank loan systems, but actually fighting through the kinks in relationships across the community or a system, getting those groups to actually come together in a collaborative culture with a shared vision, like that's actually the work. But I know I am the first to like complain and moan every time. It's like, oh, do I have to really get in that knot between those two people and figure out how we can actually get everyone to sync up? I mean, and that and that that's that's both to my own work in Iowa for years, but also the work of Hoffman. So where, and what you said is it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I struggle sometimes to try to get, um, I struggle in a sense with one thing and that is kind of, it's, it's an institutionalist ecosystem that you're describing. Or an institutional ecosystem that you're mm -hmm. describing. Yeah, I, 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 um, I did just describe four institutions. So sorry. Continue. Yeah, and and I was just so on a separate matter. I was just reading this McKinsey piece about talent and so forth, and they refer to you know schools producing workers and talent in pipelines and um and what they consistently forgot is that there's there's a human being in the process um and they're making this they're making choices at least you know people are making choices and decisions and 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 that's it's 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 as if these institutions are sort of in this manufacturing process and they're simply right putting people through um Actually. and and i'm just and somewhere I, I, and I'm not, this isn't criticism on what you described. Um, I, I try to struggle, I struggle a little bit about where we represent sort of that individual choice mm -hmm. um, or the individual acting. Um, because despite all of these institutions, people are going to do what they want to do. And so they're going to try to do what they want to do. Um, and sometimes it's, it's unorthodox. Um, and, and, that, and that needs to be sort of allowed for as well. And I'm, and I'm not sure, this, this may not be within the scope of what we're trying to talk about, which is fine, uh, but it's something that um, um, I, I routinely come back to, at least in my world when I deal on the workforce stuff, uh, for instance. Um, um, they sort of deny that there are people out there um, who have free will. But anyway. Um, I, I would just, just acknowledge just, the first thing you said on this first call of this group months and months ago, 
which is yeah. watch your analogies. Like whatever analogy you're using, you got to be careful for the unintended consequences. So I hear you in saying that we have yeah. to think of the system without thinking about the actual humans, in this case, the entrepreneurs, and their, yeah. their, their choices and decisions and their work actually in the system versus being like, having things done to them by these institutions that care about those four things, basically. Yeah, and I was, I'm not being critical of what you said. Oh, no. I, I was just, <laughs> I'm being yeah. critical of myself by saying it that way. And, I'm, and I'm, all I'm yeah. saying is that I would say my thoughts are not, my thoughts are yeah. evolving on it as well. <laughs> but that, what I shared is where I've got to. Yeah. So. Do you guys and ladies think that it's possible to separate one's personhood from one's profession, meaning, you know, Andy, when you say those four types of development, economic community, workforce, venture, those to me sounds like occupations, you mm -hmm. know, that's what someone does for a living. And yes, they're all going to have different measures of success and different metrics because their reporting processes, processes are different, but that might not be like who they are and who they identify with. Um, and an example of that is, you know, my job, my title is rural director of an entrepreneurial support organization, but there's still lots of things that I do that I consider ecosystem building that I guess could technically be connected to my job. But I'm very clear when I talk to people, especially in the community that I live in, that I'm not here as a representative of my company, I'm here because I live here and I care. So like I'm trying to get a culinary incubator started up. And while my job has resources and certainly connections that I could leverage, that's not their priority. It's not that, that ESO's priority culinary, but I think that that's so important for my rural agricultural community that I'm trying to get that off the ground and so thinking of even people that I know in the larger community that might work in an area that is specifically workforce development or community development or whatnot it's 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 the, our personhood that draws us to the ecosystem that intersection that we can strain out what we do for our jobs like and, and our jobs is what pays us but it's it's that attraction to that, you know, those four pillars um, that keeps at least me doing what I'm doing. Does that make any sense to anybody? Yeah, actually, it's it's um, it's sort of a core element of something that we've been talking about. The work I do. Um, so I we talk I talk in terms of arcs of careers, um, and you can have lots of different jobs over the course of a career. Um, but there's an identity that's attached to that the person attaches uh, to, to that career. Um, so the example I use is that I have a very good friend of mine who's a member of my board who grew up as a farm kid, and he ended up being, you know, um, acting assistant secretary in the Department of Labor uh, for U.S. Department of Labor uh, Employment and Training Administration, and um, to throughout his entire our entire friendship and we've known each other now 15, well, close to 20 years over 20 years now he always thinks of himself and talks about himself as being a farm kid and he and he but he does other jobs and he relates that farm kid experience to the other things that he's done so as you said i mean these people you occupy different jobs you're doing different things but there is an identity a lot of people, I won't say this universally, but a lot of people draw an identity from what they do, but sometimes those connections are, are you know, are on a sort of a formative, you know, based on a, a formative experience. And so, um, and it's really interesting when you, when, when you know something about the other person in the room and you can understand how they, that individual approaches a set of issues based on sort of this arc of a career, it, it, it also provides opportunities for having a conversation and building and building bridges. Um, 
So um, you're on, you're on this, but it's something we've been playing with a lot because from our standpoint, when people are told that they have to be retrained, it's sort of a denial of what they've done uh, and who they are, I think. Uh, and so we're trying to come up with a different way of describing it and talking about training and so forth and engagement in ways that respect what where they've been a, over their over their lifetime. So, does that help? Yes. Part of the issue in all of this, it comes up, it came up a couple of times in our conversation, and Mike, you I think called it out as identity, is that people like identify want to identify and be clear on where people sit. So, am I a workforce development person? Am I in the eco in the an entrepreneurial ecosystem, the music ecosystem, the creative ecosystem? There's something about American culture like we need titles or like markers, but the reality is we're all like complex individuals who live in a community and want it to be awesome. For most of us on this call, we are directly trying to influence that system. And I, I actually, my, my sort of gut reaction to your question, Tiffany, was that, that if you don't take care of your individual self and your own personal identity and really your own sense of self, you're going to get real lost in this work real quick. Yeah. You have to have a solid sense of yourself to help other people. Um, if you don't have your own shit figured out, is usually how I say it, you're not going to be able to... Uh, positively affect an ecosystem because your own shit is going to sort of get tied into like all the power dynamics and the connections and the collaborations and, and everything that happens. So I think, I think step one for all types of folks in this position is really make sure you have some self self love and strong understanding of who you are and what you, why you're doing the work because it's easy to get, it's easy to get lost. So Andy, where the title does get into the, get in the way though, is that and it has it's a reality and that is it's it's the way that you're measured in terms of your performance mm -hmm. so whatever it is that you you do to say if you're in the workforce field um you're measured against um wioa um performance measures you're, you're measured against expectations that your workforce board or whatever has for you or for your you know, educational institution and the, and the like and those measures often um um can can def can narrow your vision in terms of what you can and cannot do, um, and limit can be a limitation on your participation in an ecosystem. And so it seems to me that one of the jobs of the ecosystem um, builder or whatever we're calling is to be able to define opportunities in the context of where that person is function because sometimes just just showing them how or her how what what engagement in an ecosystem can, can do in terms of their own performance measures can open up a whole variety of new opportunities for that for that person to participate in in, in, the, in the larger system so i think it's often the responsibility of the outsider to sort of look in and say well you know, this is how we can make this work for you. Interesting. So I have a question. And I guess maybe this goes to Andy. So when you think, when you think back at the work that all of the different um, groups are doing, do you have a view of what success looks like? And so if you were to look back at the work that we're doing as a group, what would you need to see in order to say that we've been successful or we've done a good job? So that's partially what this group is about, I think. I mean, partially that that they're, it depends on what you, depends on, okay, there's a Kaufman view of what success is and there's a community of people who've been around the issue of the goals that, of what success looks like. I, I think we are still, and the question of this group ultimately is how can we get to a shared vision for, if you will, the field or the national or even the global this work? And I don't want to speak for the entire community, so I don't, I don't know what the community wants. And and I think we, uh, I mean, I think I can sort of guess based on like individual feedback, which is that people just want to be able to do their work better in local communities, and and to be able to 
know how to do ecosystem building better, find tools and resources, and be able to do it to make their community better and more vibrant place. That would be my guess. I don't know, but uh, as a field, I don't, I can't speak on behalf of the field to say this is exactly what I can say. What I think success looks like from my desk at the Coffin Foundation, on behalf of the Coffin Foundation, I think it's, it sort of can be simplified in the statement: an ecosystem builder in every community. That that entrepreneurial ecosystem builder, just to be clear, per our earlier conversation, um, and that it's that it's communities everywhere. Um, adopt entrepreneurial ecosystem building as an approach to economic and community development. And in doing that, they unlock more, uh, more entrepreneurial uh, energies in communities to let entrepreneurs manifest and live the, 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 the life and turn their ideas into things, which, you know, based on, you know, all the things we've talked about in the past and in different ways that we think, and I, I deeply believe, creates community vibrancy and, and really help change communities for the better. Anybody else have a want to crack on what the what what would they think the field of ecosystem building, the very nascent and emerging field, what success looks like in ten years, twenty thirty? <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe that's I, a good wrap up question. We could all take a one sentence stab at. Or Eric, go for it. Answer for all of us. <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. I, I think, you know, in some ways, I'm I've been wondering about sort of the scope and scale of wh what we're thinking about. And sometimes I like the big, bold, long-term goal. And I think in this moment, and partially because I haven't been participating so often in the, in the goal three activities, you know, I poke my head in when I can, and it's fascinating, and I wish I was involved more. Um, but I think right now, and maybe it's just the other work that's going on this week, I'm feeling very, very tactical. So I'm thinking, you know, what could we possibly have, you know, in a handout or on stage, you know, in June or in the prep for June, or what could we have by the end of 2020? So to me, you know, to me having that declaration or that unified statement of, um, I forget what 3.1 was, you know, having that explicit where like a draft of that that's available at that eShip Summit, that feels like it's something that's pretty doable. Um, and I, to your point earlier, Andy, um, I like the idea of it be recognizing that the ship summit is not the conclusion of the year, but it is sort of a milestone that we can use in various different ways. So I think having something that gets presented there as a, you know, somewhat completed project would be useful. But I love the idea of having something that's also like having the process in place to really deal with that field-wide mission, vision, values. I think whether that's a Congress or some other way of bringing people together, but um, and I'm rambling a little bit, but I'll, I'll say that the goal to call the other day, one of the things we talked about was maybe it's better if we try to take that collaborative culture work. Mm -hmm. Can we, you know, team up with a different goal or a different project to kind of focus on that aspect of collaboration and helping move a project forward. And this, this the, the 3.1 here feels like one of those sort of perfect, you know, perfect projects for us to work on. So I'm wondering if what we might be able to come up with that we could present and get people on board into a manageable project that, you know, makes something happen. Let me, can you remind us what three point, did you say three is? Yeah, so let's see, I, I, I was making some notes here. So the 3.1, that's that field-wide mission, vision, values, and outcomes. That's that consensus of what that shared vision, you know, so to me, like the, the capstone for this goal, that's that piece. The yeah. one, <laughs> the 3.3, let me pull this back up. Yeah, I get confused too. Um, 3.3, that was that universal uh, ecosystem builder pledge. And we've seen some neat pledges from different communities. You know, uh, I know there's one, a good one um, up in Canada of kind of these ecosystem builder kind of pledges. That feels like it's, it feels like bringing together three or four similar kinds of pledges and having this group kind of talk through what we like from them, what we don't like, and how we might be able to condense that into something we could present as a draft. That feels pretty, pretty tangible and pretty tactical. Anyway, that's that's where my head's going at the moment. <laughs> I, would, I would offer, and I know we're, I just realized we're over time, but I'll, I'll offer here, which is, you know, one thing that I, I have control of, which is the eShip Summit agenda, 
if there was a group that wanted to come together, whether it's specifically this group or just a subset of folks on this call and maybe even that other call you were saying. And to spend this, the first couple of months of the year actually getting to a draft of a pledge that say a group of eight people was super excited about and said, this really represents what we think is a first cut that we could find a way working with that group to perhaps share it at the summit with 500 ecosystem builders or people interested in ecosystem building get some feedback and perhaps maybe even, I'm making this up, but perhaps even if we sort of can come to some consensus, that could inform obviously that mission-wide vision values, whatever, but maybe even have people sign it or, or some sort of rat ratification by a large group of people. I think the fourth summit really seems like, I mean, I know people are sort of waiting for something like, uh, okay, just, you know, like just distill it. And, I, and, I, and the truth be told is I'm not gonna be the person that distills it. I, I'm a wonky guy that works at a foundation who makes so he writes emails all day. Like the actual people doing ecosystem building would really inform what that pledge would probably look like. But happy to offer up the summit as an opportunity uh, to, to get feedback and potentially engage hundreds of people on a draft. So I'll say, I love that. <laughs> you know, as many thumbs as I can put up, uh, <laughs> I love that idea. <laughs> So perhaps the, the, the question may be uh, for this group to take on at the next meeting in January. And I'm, I'm using, I've, I've just been introduced to strategic viewing. If you're not familiar with it, Google it. It's an awesome thing. Uh, it's a process for cl complex collaboration. They start with an appreciative inquiry question, which is you ask a question that sort of gets people moving. And the question is how could something like, how could we, or imagine, imagine at the 2020 summit, a small group of folks like folks on this call we're able to present a draft pledge for ecosystem builders everywhere, what would that process be to get us there? Or what would we do to get there? Maybe that's a thing this group could take on. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to tell people what to do, but I'm just saying that's a, perhaps a- I think that'd be great. This, this group has a particularly challenging uh, topic, which is how do, we, how do we sort of come to consensus on the things we do? Some of the other groups can just do stuff and they don't have, there's just one, there could be seven trainings or mm -hmm. 23, you know, organizations that, that teach ecosystem building, but there can, there probably can only be one field wide vision pledge, whatever. Now, I mean, there can't only be one, but it's really helpful if there's one we can come to consensus on across all the fields. And with that, I think that's a great note to end the call on. Eric, yay for being a doer. Thank you for that input. And all of this information should be on the notes and agenda page. Um, if anyone has anything to add, please, please do. Andy. My, uh, my other 2020 goal is to get Eric to commit to saying ecosystem or ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> I see you struggle with that every day. <laughs> That's a good question. I have no idea. Well. <laughs> Great. I, um, I appreciate everybody's time and want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays, and uh, rest and renew yourself. Uh, and Mike, I want to really send my good energies and love to your family. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, Mike, uh, my, um, my um, thoughts are going to be with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Hey. See you next year. Thanks for leading, Tim. Bye.